inspiration uh, from from this uh, presentation. And a lot of what I'm going to be saying is based on this book, which is so far only available in Swedish, um, which I wrote together with a friend of mine, Anneby. Uh, came out last year, and um, to our great surprise, it received the the Gardening Book of the Year merit in Sweden. Mm -hmm which kind of brought this into mainstream in Sweden. That's also why I'm touring so much right now. Like all these ordinary uh, gardening associations start to invite me. So it's not just permaculturists and forest gardeners and agroforestry. People who invite us nowadays, it's just ordinary flower ladies coming us as well. That's, that's quite nice. They're quite enthusiastic about this. And they know a lot about forest gardening too, about the species especially. Um, yeah, and apart, of, apart from writing books, I am um, based in, in um, as in the yeah two hours northwest of Stockholm. What was it called again? In Finnish. Dalema. Dalema, yeah, Dalema, Dalana, um, the county of Dalana in the south eastern corner of that county. Uh, I've been living there for ten years, and I've been um, planting trees for twelve years uh, in that area. And um, we have a nursery in Kanchun where I live, where we also sell uh, forest gardening plants. We do courses, lectures, and so on. So it's. Um, uh, this has become my, my main source, or actually only source of income, this um, forest gardening work. Actually, to, before that I was, a, was an engineer, worked in Stockholm, commuted between Uppsala and Stockholm, and working long hours in front of the computer, but luckily I could turn my passion into my source of income as well. I wouldn't call it a job, but because uh, it's my passion and what I really enjoy doing all the time. Anyhow, enough about that. Uh, I'd just like to start this lecture by noting that Nature wants to create forest. Uh, let's turn this on as well. Here, nature wants to create forest almost everywhere uh, in our planet, uh, up here in Scandinavia and, and uh, Finland. Um, and we see that process happening in the back. <coughs> I remember this business out of Sweden, and I just uh, stopped the car as, as fast as I could when I saw this uh, this field emerging. Because uh, I, 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 I thought this is the perfect example of nature creating a forest. It's a pasture. Um, there were two horses. They ran away when, when I stopped the car with squealing brakes. Um, so you can't see them, but it's, it's quite a big pasture and just two, uh, two horses. They couldn't keep this open alone. So you see that the forest is creeping in into this pasture. Uh, you have some kind of an oak forest in the back. And then different pioneering species in the front here. They're kind of creeping in from, from behind. Uh, it's different salix, aspen, um, uh, what do you call them, birches as well. Uh, and in the front, the process has not come as far. You have brambles and raspberries, uh, some elderberries, these red ones, um, which is, I think, an um, invasive species in Finland. It's not invasive in Sweden for some reason. And those the same climate. And here in the middle, there's still some grass left. But you see there's docks coming in. You notice they have like, these really deep tap roots. And they're also breaking ground for the trees and the forest to come into this pasture. So if the landowner doesn't do anything about this, this is going to revert back to forest within a decade or two, probably, this whole pasture. So somebody has to come and do something. Uh, and then, of course, we can ask ourselves, why <coughs> is this, pro this, this natural forest so strong that wants to create forest in almost all places in our planet? Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but I picked out three of the maybe main reasons for why forest is so dominant uh, as an ecosystem. Uh, and one of them is that it's most stable, simply. If you look at other ecosystems, like this pasture, a grassland, um, disturbed land, uh, open soil after a landslide, stuff like that, it's on its way of becoming something different. Those are not stable ecosystems, they're becoming a forest. While a forest, once it has become a forest, usually stays a forest, even if there's a disturbance, um, like a, a big fire, flooding, drought, whatever, a lot of trees may die in that process, in that disturbance, but still, usually we call it still a forest. Uh, the only thing that actually can kill a forest, uh, in, like, uh, at least when you look at normal disturbances, would be a big forest machine uh, clear-cutting the whole forest, then it's gone. Uh, and also all the interactions that are taking place in the forest are gone. Uh, so clear cutting is not the same as a storm or a fire as the forestry industry, at least in Sweden, tries to persuade us. Um, they don't know their ecology. Well, they probably do know it, but uh, they're not honest about it. So it's very stable. A forest remains a forest if there's not a major disruption coming. 
And that's, of course, because it's uh, <coughs> simply because of the, uh, all these interactions and connections that are existing in the forest. Uh, they, they make it most stable. Um, the species diversity makes that it doesn't get uh, attacked by pests as much. If there are pests coming, they're not a big problem. A few trees will die, but the forest is still going to be there. So it's resilient, you could say, also. The forest is a very resilient ecosystem. And, and it all I think it all boils down to that. The forest is, compared to other land-based ecosystems, it's most effect effective at converting sunlight, sunlight to biomass. Um, and that's both for uh, deciduous and coniferous forest, uh, depending on which type is natural in, in the place you're looking at. The forest is the most effective one at converting sunlight to biomass in the long run. In the short run, you might plant some salix and they're going to catch a lot of sunlight to produce biomass, but they're killing themselves after a while if you just leave them. But the forest is very um, effective at this. And that means uh, that the forest is collecting more resources, uh, which the forest reinvests all the time. Uh, invests them in wood, which is a long-term investment. The wood's eventually going to fall down and, and become food for soil life, and that's going to be recycled into the trees. Uh, but it's also short-term investments, uh, which is basically sugars that are being extracted or pumped out into the soil ecosystem while the trees are photosynthesizing. So the, the, the forest gets, uh, due to this um, high efficiency or productivity, higher productivity, it gets a advantage, a competitive advantage compared to, um, to other ecosystems. A grassland is good at uh, photosynthesizing too, but not as good as the forest. So the forest always gets one step ahead, ahead of the grassland. With every season that passes, it gets one step further. Um, and of course, the species diversity has to do a lot with this. When you have these spring ephemerals that are green now underneath the trees, they have a very short life cycle uh, just before the trees leap out. They can also harvest sunlight, and then the trees start harvesting sunlight. And you have some species that are late to shed their leaves, so we also have a long harvesting season uh, in the forest. And all of that adds up to the competitive advantage of the forest compared to uh, other ecosystems. And we can just note that to begin with. Are, are you with me so far? Yeah. Yeah, yeah? otherwise just put up your hand and, and ask. Uh, and this process of um, non-forested land uh, that is changing character uh, is called ecological succession. That term is not very um, present in most people's minds, but you've all seen it happening. It happens all the time, everywhere. And we can also state or note at this point that this is the farmer's enemy. Uh, all farmers, most farmers enemy probably. And it's not just the farmer's enemy, this natural process uh, of nature wanting to create forest. It's also everyone who's tried to <coughs> grow carrots knows that we have to fight ecological succession. Otherwise, we're not going to get any carrots. Uh, when I started growing vegetables um, about 12 years ago, uh, I had read this book by Fukuoka, the, the One Straw Revolution, and he wrote that you can just throw out seeds and you're going to have uh, peppers and pumpkins and stuff, and I didn't really get what he was writing, so I, I was like, okay, I'll throw out my carrot seeds uh, on my lawn, and of course and I didn't get any, not one carrot, that, that didn't even sprout probably. Um, so you can't grow carrots without first fighting nature, basically, setting back the ecological succession to a state of open soil loose, nice, open soil. And you have to be there all the time. You can't just sow them once and then walk away. You have to water them, you have to do, do weeding and so on. You have to fight this natural force all the time. Uh, and we can also say that um, the human race uh, at this point has, in a way, perfectionized the fight against this natural force, against ecological succession. We started about 10,000 years ago uh, on a major scale when we started to create open soil to, to grow our food. Uh, and now, I guess, the, the worst developments or the latest developments in this is, um, are these GMO crops and Roundup Ready crops and Roundup and all that, and these big machines. It's all instruments for fighting nature, fighting succession, uh, fighting nature's will to create a forest. Uh, and I'm not the first one to question this um, way of treating the land. Um, so there's probably been a lot of people before me throughout history that are, they've been thinking like this is a bit crazy. We put like all this energy before the industrial re revolution. We, we used a lot of um, manpower, slaves, animals, so on to fight succession. Uh, and later on, we started to use fossil fuels. We're using a lot of fossil fuels on this right now. 
uh, just to find some fight a, a natural force that's really really powerful why can't we do the other way around we learn to domesticate the wind the water and so on why can't we learn to domesticate ecological succession uh, domesticates maybe the wrong term but at least work with it so that's that's basically the, the basic idea behind forest gardening is that we can make this ecological succession into our friend it's a hypothesis uh, we're still working on it um, and but we see a lot of examples that this is actually working in, in real life we can team up with the ec ecological succession uh, tame it in a way domesticate is probably um, too far-fetched but tame it in a way and work together with ecological succession uh, to produce food in a different way and of course other crops as well but most forest gardeners are into food crops um, still uh, all right still with me that's that's like the most basic most important insight for me at least i never talked about succession seven or eight years ago when i started teaching forest gardening i was talking about species and polycultures and all that but i never talked about succession now it's always the thing that i start with because it's so basic and so fundamental to this uh, 